Hi everyone, welcome to today's seminar, the CGDG seminar. We have two talks today. The first one will be from um, Margot Chase Topping on um, pigs infectivity and susceptibility. And so Margot is a statistical epidemiologist who was who has primarily worked in epidemiological modeling of disease control in livestock. And she's currently at Rosling analyzing data from transmission study for PRRSV, ISA, and Marcus disease. Margot. So this is the talk that I'm going to give at the World Congress on the 8th of July. So um, it's still new. So if, if you have any comments, um, I'd sort of really appreciate them at this stage. OK, spoiler alert. This is my title and my conclusion. In the middle, however, I want to tell you about a small bespoke transmission experiment that was designed by my co-authors to look at whether GBP5 resistance gene had any effect on pigs infectivity or susceptibility. And these are two host traits of transmission. So despite biosecurity measures and vaccination, PERS prevalence continues to be high. In fact, PERS arguably remains one of the most important infectious diseases for the pig industry worldwide. One of the proposed strategies is to breed animals that are genetically more disease resilient, meaning they maintain high performance levels in the face of pathogen challenge. But an effective selection program for disease resilience must also reduce pathogen transmission within and between farms, as herd resilience also depends on the pathogen load in the environment. GPP-5 is one candidate for inclusion into the breeding programs. GBP5 was first identified during the large-scale challenge studies conducted, conducted by the PERS host genetic consortium. Pigs that were heterozygous had, um, among several things, a lower virus load, faster growth, and more effective vaccine response. However, it's not known whether pigs of, with the GBP5 genotype confer difference in susceptibility and infectivity of pigs under natural PERS challenge conditions. So the objective of this study was to assess whether the resistance gene also confers lower susceptibility and or infectivity, our two host traits of transmission of pigs under natural PERS transmission. To meet this objective, my co-authors designed a small experiment and it's quite a complicated design, so I'd like to walk you through the different steps over the next few slides. So the study design consisted of two steps. Step one involved the natural, uh, the, involved the infection of shedder pigs through natural exposure to PERS infected inoculation pigs. And step two was the main transmission trial. A total of 164 commercial crossbred pigs these were sibling groups, primarily full sibs or paternal half sib progeny. Approximately half of the pigs from each sibling group carried the dominant resistant allele, which I'll now refer to as R plus, and half did not carry it, which I'll call R minus. The key is that we are testing the transmission of naturally infected pigs, controlling for the genetic relatedness of the animals using sibling groups matched across different treatments. So in the first step, pigs, all R minus, were inoculated with either a barcoded, shown in blue, or a non-barcoded version in red of a PERS-V strain circulating in the North American pig farms. So it's the same virus strain, it's just one is barcoded and one is not. The barcoding was applied so that we could track pig genotype specific transmission. Prior to using the barcoding, a pilot experiment was carried out to ensure that the barcoding resulted in no effect on pathogenesis as measured using viral load, temperature, and weight gain. One day after inoculation, the shedder pigs were introduced into two rooms, each consisting of equal proportion of pigs of each genotype. R plus is shown as closed circles, R minus as open circles with siblings of the same R genotype split across rooms. So the shedder pigs were comprised of 12 sibling groups. 
Blue means the pigs were in contact with the barcoded inoculated pigs. Red means the pigs were in contact with the non-barcoded inoculated pigs. So the blue are now called Cheddar Infection Group 1, and the red are called Cheddar Infection Group 2. The naturally infected Cheddar pigs were transferred into four new rooms containing naive contact pigs. Prior to transfer, the Cheddar pigs were tested to ensure that they were infected. The naive contact pigs consisted of 24 sibling groups, all full sibs, 12 pigs per genotype. Contact pigs are shown as squares, closed squares representing the R plus genotype and open squares representing the R minus genotype. The shedder pigs were mixed prior to being put in with the contact pigs and we have the formation of two shedder combination groups, each with one, each with one replicate each. To minimize reinfection, shedder pigs were removed at day 14. The entire trial lasted only 18 days. This was enough time to ensure that the contact pigs were infected by the shedder pigs and contact to contact pig transmission was limited. So basically the trial contained three types of pigs. The inoculator pigs, which were directly infected, and these are shown as the jagged symbol. These were infected with either a barcoded blue or a non-barcoded, shown in red, version of the same virus. Shedder pigs are shown as circles, their color matching the inoculator pigs that they were exposed to. Contact pigs are shown as squares. For all pigs, a closed symbol refers to a pig with an R plus genotype, and an open symbol refers to a pig with an R minus genotype. And I'll carry this formatting through the entire talk. So sampling was carried out via serum and nasal swabs. This slide shows a timeline of when the samples were collected. Sample time was standardized for shedder and contact pigs. Samples were collected from inoculator pigs at day one to confirm infection status. Samples were collected from shedder pigs at day five, seven, nine, and 13 days post contact with directly infected inoculator pigs. And this is referred to as DPCS. Samples were collected from contact pigs at two, seven, and 10 days post-contact from naturally infected shedder pigs, and this is referred to as DPCC. So our objective is to assess genotype differences in infectivity and susceptibility, and this talk is actually based on a subset of analysis conducted for a manuscript that's close to its submission. This slide highlights the different ways in which we looked for differences. For the purpose of this talk, I will just be looking at those analyses that are starred. This includes looking at total viral load, which may be an important indicator for shedder pig infectivity, as more infectious pigs would be expected to harbor and shed more virus, or for contact pig susceptibility, as the virus may be able to replicate faster in more susceptible pigs. Genotype difference in contact pig susceptibility could manifest itself through difference in the proportion of infected R plus or R minus contact pigs, and we would expect more susceptible R minus pigs to become infected, and also more susceptible pigs may become infected earlier. Total viral load was estimated by calculating the area under the viremia curve for each of the shedder and contact pigs. Proportional or sort of infected, non-infected data was analyzed using generalized linear mixed models. Area under the curve data was analyzed using linear mixed models. Genotype was included in each model with sibling group fitted as a random effect. Other effects were added depending upon whether the model was for shedder or contact pigs. All relevant interactions were tested but removed if they did not improve the overall fit of the model and model fit was assessed by looking at improvement in BIC. So I mentioned the use of sibling groups within this study, and the addition of sibling group improved the fit. In other words, it lowered the BIC of all models tested. These figures show the serum AUC or area of the curve for the different shedder pigs on the left and contact pigs on the right. Variation across sibling groups was low, 
accounting for only about 12% of the variation in the area under the curve. And there was no systematic ranking of genotypes in CRMAUC. In particular, our R plus pigs did not have systematically lower AUC values than R minus pigs. In fact, some of the lowest um, AUC values for both shedder and contact pigs were actually R minus genotypes. So there was no direct evidence for genotype difference in shedder pig infectivity or contact pig susceptibility. All pigs in this study became infected with the exception of one contact pig, and in fact, that was R minus genotype. And there were no differences in terms of the genotype of the infected contact pig at two days post contact with the naturally injected, infected cheddar pigs. This table shows the results of the DLMM analysis adjusting for initial weight of the pigs, and you can see that contact genotype is not statistically significant. Each graph here shows the mean area under the curve for shedder pigs with either the R plus or the R minus genotype. The left graph is for shedder group one and the right is for shedder group two. As you can see in the graph, there was no significant genotype effect on the shedder infection level, regardless of the shedder infection group that the pigs originated from. Here we have the mean area under the curve for contact pigs with either R plus or R minus genotype. The left graph is for contact pigs that were infected by an R minus shedder, and the right is for contact pigs that were infected by an R plus shedder. There was no significant genotype effect on contact pig infection level, regardless of the R genotype of the contact pig or of the shedder pig that was transmitting the infection. So this study provides no supportive evidence that the GBP5 resistance gene confers differences in host susceptibility or infectivity under natural PERS transmission. All pigs used in the study became infected and there was no difference in the overall viral load of shedder or contact pigs as measured by area under the curve. Given the relatively small scale of the present study and the potential implication of the results on the pig industry, it is paramount for the results to be validated before dismissing GBP5 effects on PERS transmission. Resistance to PERS is mostly polygenic, and there are other candidate genes that have been identified. Similar transmission experiments could be carried out on these genes or using pigs with high, low polygenic estimated breeding values. While genetics can contribute to increased resilience of our animals, Disease surveillance, biosecurity, and vaccination remain important for the effective disease control. And just finally, I'd like to thank the funders and the collaborators, and a special thanks to the Wilson Group at Rosin for listening to many versions of this talk. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> In the chat online, you can uh, pop your question at the chat, or if you want to ask it, you can unmute yourself. So these are all, all the pigs you had in the study. Maybe I missed the previous section. They're on com commercial pigs. Those are all primary pigs. They they were supplied by. Uh, they were all commercial pigs. Yes, they were provide um, fast genetics. Pigs were supplied by fast genetics. Okay. I can't actually tell if there's any. Do you have any question in the room? Yes, there is a question. Uh, not, not, a, not a question, just since you're going to be presenting it again at the World Congress, uh, like some of the slides probably could do with being a bit bigger, just for the people in the back, like font wise as well. Really? Because that's 24. We, uh, we always get from the hand lab, we need 40. 40? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, there are the two. Oh, my, I know. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, this is, it's, it's, 
you are totally right. This is one of the big problems always. I, I always thought 24 is what you get away with, but it shouldn't get smaller, definitely. So it, it really depends on the room, how big the room is, and we don't know. Yeah, yes. um, uh, and that's actually something, I mean, for all everybody who is in the work conversation, so that um, uh, I've been sitting sometimes at night, you know, I prepare my presentation and then I notice that I'm in a shitty room. Um, and then, you know, I really changed the font size in the last minute. Yeah. It's really important because you're right, if people can't read it, it's one of the real, it's, it's, um, it's really bad for your presentation when people can't read the text. So, um, yeah, maybe keep flexible potentially to increase the font size. I think 24 is okay. Mine's small, but it's a bit bigger than 20, but... Yeah, yeah, you really need to <laughs> change it. <laughs> yeah. but then again, I put these four countries in those. Yeah, so Sorry. Just a suggestion as well, a great presentation, um, but with your graphical representation of your experimental design, I think it might be helpful if you put maybe a key for the, you know, the colour circle, the, the clothes, or open what they mean, so it would be a little bit easier to follow okay. essentially what each group is. It's um, maybe the same key on every slide. Don't you know? It sort of goes back and forth, I think. It's on the relevant slide if I'm talking about it. And I guess at the end, I do mention what the entire code is again, so I could put it there. Super complicated experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know it may not fit, but just, yeah, just a little okay. bit. Yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. I mentioned also the diagram, like also the time phrase, because like the way it just up, I mean, as you say, up. So people can follow the time frame of the okay. the design is good, but if it's just there, it's difficult. But if it comes in pieces, it's easier to follow. Okay, so I can put the timeline on every no uh, animation. Yes, yeah, but you've done that, no? Um, the shadow or inoculation and the shadows. Yeah, but maybe. I'll take another look at it. I mean, obviously, that's, I'm so familiar with the design now, so uh, <laughs> um, it's easy to, to forget that. You have like the, the boxes are there, but they come when the slide is open. Mm -hmm. So, like, if they could come whenever she says, okay, this, and then at day two, then the boxes come, and then um, someone is buying this one. Oh, uh, so at the time, I'm in the yeah, I can do that. We have a question online from Enrique. Uh, so he said, nice presentation, just a very light question. I could not see it well, but it seems that the fixed effect in the models were different from the two set of picks. Why not use a concordant model that would control the same factors in both cases? Um, I suppose in some cases it is the same. So I'm controlling for pig weight in both of them. The random effect is sibling group in both of them, and the genotype of the pigs is both. But what what I guess what's in the contact pigs because they sort of come later on is the shedder information. But I guess I just don't know that I need the contact information for the shedder models. Is that? No, you don't need to put a contact pig genotype in a mm. shedder model. It doesn't make sense. So that the, the problem, the difficulty. This is analysis is a bit of a more if that was easy to pick up, but for example, the contact, the model where you have the infection level of the contact pig doesn't give information only about the susceptibility of the contact pig. It actually also provides information about the infectivity of the shadow pig because we know which shadow genotype infected that contact pig. And, and that's why these models are quite asymmetric because the contact pig information model that gives actually information on both traits susceptibility of the contact pig, how likely is it to become infected, how severely is it infected. And it also gives information is the severity or whether it's infected or not. Is it more likely to become infected by an R plus shader or by an R minus shader? And does its viral load depend on? Did, did it get the infection from the R plus or the R minus shader? And and that's why this so and, and for the shadow pick this doesn't apply, right? Because the shadow pick only gives information about infectivity. 
The shadow pig, we didn't measure in susceptibility because they were in contact with the inoculation pigs and it was a different, the aim was not to, to get susceptibility of the shadow pigs. And that's why the two models can't be the same, as you're saying, but it's, the, the experiment is very, very non-standard because these traits are so difficult. So, uh, and that's why the models, you have to be very, very careful that you're accounting for the right things to get that information. Any more question in the room or online? Maybe we can. Thank you, Margot. That was really interesting. Uh, we can start with a second talk. Yeah, Enrique said that uh, I think it would be good to spend a bit of time explaining that when describing the model, but indeed, very good talk. Thanks, Enrique. And So can you see the slides online? Oh my. Yes, perfect. So the next second talk of the day is uh, from Jamie Prentice from the same lab. He's also an applied mathematician who has primarily worked in epidemiological modeling of disease control in livestock. Uh, he's currently working at Roslin on quantifying genetic traits for disease, trans disease transmission using pedigree and epidemic data and examining the role exam examining the role of vaccine in virus evolution. Uh, Jamie, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, this is also uh, a talk which I'll be giving at the WC Gallup later on. So. Please feel free to uh, critique me heavily, and I do apologise in advance if the font size isn't high enough for everybody. Right. Okay, so um, infectious disease is a huge threat to agriculture, and one approach to uh, controlling it is breeding for better disease resistance. Now, we know that there is considerable genetic uh, variation in host response to infection, which we can exploit. This does, however, require inferring breeding values in some way. However, difficulty in inferring these breeding values means that we have made limited use of the genetic variation available to us and may not be exploiting all possible uh, disease traits. So there are three main components to, uh, that are important to uh, disease transmission. One, how easily an individual is infected. Two, how long it remains infectious before either recovering or dying. And three, how infectious it is to others during this period. And these are covered by the three key traits. Susceptibility, how likely the individual is to become infected following exposure. Infectivity, how likely it is to transmit infection to other individuals. And recoverability, stroke, disease, induced mortality. How quickly it recovers also comes to infection. This is may sometimes come up as the uh, trait endurance. And this uh, ask, uh, leads to the question can we breed animals that have better breeding values in all of these traits? Uh, to date, we have only used it uh, in one or two traits, mainly susceptibility, but we've not managed to do it on infectivity to the best of my knowledge. So here, we want to be able to combine epidemic and relationship data in order to identify genetic variation in uh, the three key epidemiological traits, susceptibility, infectivity, and mortality, and find estimated breeding values for those traits in uh, relatives of the individuals who take part in the epidemic. So our approach is to create a model that includes those traits to capture the dynamics of disease transmission, and then we fit that model to epidemic data using bespoke inference software, SIA 2.1. And then we use that model to test prediction accuracies for estimated breeding values. Um, the subjects of our experiments are turbot, which is a commercially important flatfish, 
and scuticociliatosis, uh, a skin infection caused by the protozoan uh, Philosterides dysentrachi. Uh, scuticociliatosis is a useful infection to study because it is easy to visually identify infected fish. Uh, signs of infection include skin lesions, colour change and death, um, which makes experimentation more easy. Um, so, um, this may be the point where people can't read it. <laughs> For the experimental design, um, there were uh, 1,800 fish um, distributed into 72 isolated tanks. Um, and each fish, uh, each tank uh, has 25 fish. Um, the epidemic was started in each tank by seeding five donors who were inoculated with the disease. Um, and these were, uh, and then these were put in on with 20 naive recipients. Um, there were 60 families in total, and the families were distributed in order to maximize statistical power for parameter estimation. Uh, the phenotypic data used for the genetic analyses consisted of individual records of the time, days post exposure, uh, at which visual signs were first observed, and time of death. Uh, siren dam information was available for all individuals and used to generate the um, uh, num numerator relationship matrix. Um, and there's papers uh, by Anna Cleto et al. and Sarah et al. from 2019, which describe this in more detail. Um, so, if we take a look at what the data looks like, um, here we see um, a plotting of the uh, infection data. Uh, we see initial peak of symptoms. Right about here. So, that's the uh, system of the donors who are infected at time zero. Um, but it's likely that they may have a different disease trajectory to the recipients. And so we may need to consider incorporating fixed effects for donors into the model. Uh, notice that if an individual is an asymptomatic spreader or an incubator, then we can't actually determine their visual their disease status visually. Um, so the blue line it represents susceptibles, but it may also represent um, incubators and even infectives who are currently asymptomatic. Close inspection of the data reveals that all the donors took several days before showing symptoms. So that indicated to us that we needed to include a latent period. And in some cases, some of the recipient fish showed symptoms, uh, even when the donors did not, uh, showing that there is an asymptomatic infectious state. So we needed to, these were important parts that we needed to include in the model. And it was a bit of a surprise, unfortunately. It gave us a few headaches um, to deal with before we could continue. So what does the model that we come uh, created look like? We begin by categorizing each fish into one of five distinct categories. Uh, susceptible, exposed, but not yet infectious, so incubating the uh, disease. Infectious, but asymptomatic. Infectious, uh, but detectable, so symptomatic. Um, and recovered or removed. Um, historically, we use the word recovered a lot, um, but in this case, um, it really does refer to uh, removed from the model. But it's, uh, there's a bit of momentum for using the recovered state. Right. So we layer into the model uh, various components. So in the orange, which may be hard to see here, but I'll um, read them out. Um, we see the population mean parameters. So here we have the beta, which is the transmission coefficients, um, which is the rate at which uh, individuals are infected. Uh, eta, um, which is the latency parameter, which determines how quickly individuals move from the exposed to the infected states. Rho, which is the uh, detection parameter um, for how quickly they move into the detected states. And gamma, which is um, how quickly they recover or die. Uh, in blue, 
available the event times. So these are the times that events actually happen. We've got uh, T inf, so the time at which an individual is infected. T inc, the time at which it moves in from the exposed state into the infectious state. T debt, which is the time at which it first was detected. So at this point, we are aware, we know that it's infected. And T rec, which is the time that it's uh, it dies. And then in purple, I've noted the uh, genetics where the three key traits act, susceptibility, recoverability, and infectivity. Uh, now to introduce some equations. Um, so new infections, um, where they move from state S to state E, they occur at, uh, for each fish, the false infection, lambda I, uh, is determined by the um, mean um, population parameter beta. Um, now, susceptibility, um, we need to note that the three genetic traits, uh, G, uh, F and R, they're all log normally distributed with mean zero. So these values, G, R and F, uh, are, have mean zero. So when we take the um, exponential of them, we uh, have a value which has mean one, almost. Um, and so the uh, these represent um, fractional deviations from the population mean. Um, in a model without genetics, the, uh, it would we just have a beta SI, but here we have to, to uh, account for each of the individual susceptibilities and infections. Uh, the transition times, uh, labeled in blue, these are all uh, gamma distributed, um, with uh, the latent period has mean one over uh, eta, Detection periods mean one over rho, and recovery periods um, one over gamma times the uh, recoverability rate. So a high recoverability um, trait means you take longer to recover, so you survive longer. I know that sounds backward, but uh, in this case, it means you survive longer before you die. Um, and finally, um, turning this into the uh, genetics um, the equation for these. Um, the individual based fractional deviations of the traits are given by the design matrix X um, and the fixed effects vector B. So this uh, enables us to take traits such as uh, whether or not they're a donor or a recipient, uh, whether or not they are um, uh, in trial one or trial two, and apply the fixed effects. Uh, and the additional um, and, and environmental genetic effects, uh, vectors A and epsilon, which are multivariate, normally distributed according to the appropriate covariance matrices. Um, and now I'll introduce the uh, inference software that we're using. So this is SIA 2.1 that stands for Susceptibility, Infectivity and Recoverability Estimator. Uh, it's Bayesian inference using Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques written in C++ by Chris Pooley. Uh, version 1 was originally published in PLOS Computational Biology in 2020. Chris will be also at uh, WC Gallup um, presenting his version 2.0. Um, but uh, version 2.1 was expanded to accommodate the fishbridge data because uh, it didn't, it wasn't able to handle certain things like latent periods, which uh, was important for this data set. And it's available uh, from the uh, uh, GitHub, uh, the iTeam slash SIA 2.1. So SIA takes various inputs. Um, primarily the uh, observed event times per individual taking part in the epidemic. Um, so we have the time of infection, but these are only for the uh, donors, that's time uh, zero. Infection times are not observed for recipients. Uh, and the time that the infection was detected and the time of death, if these are available. Um, the model definition, which will include the various states and transitions and where any fixed effects apply. Uh, we need to provide priors for all the parameters, so we need to kind of uh, restrict um, the, the, the range which parameters are allowed to uh, vary. Uh, the genetic architecture, so which is some indication of how the individuals are related, uh, which includes those that do not take part in the epidemic, 
the, uh, the size of the dams whose values we wish to infer, their breeding values. Uh, also, the, um, we can provide the true genetic variance and covariances and the true breeding values, which if we've simulated the data using the model, then we do know those values and we can then um, use those to determine how well SAI is performing. Um, as outputs, SAI gives us the posterior distributions for all the model parameters. Uh, so for the population mean parameters, beta, eta, rho and gamma, for all the fixed effects, the donor's tank and uh, trial, um, provides us with the additive genetic environmental variance co covariance uh, and provides us with estimated breeding values for each trait. And again, um, if we have the true breeding values and the estimated breeding values, then we can um, know how accurate, uh, how well SI has performed. So armed with SIA, we now need to make sure that we've chosen the right model. Uh, we start by visually inspecting the data, which I've mentioned earlier, to determine those basic model that captures the essential features. And then we apply SIA and look for evidence that those features are indeed necessary. For example, if we consider the latent periods, uh, looking at the posterior, a 95% credible interval uh, excludes zero, suggesting that a zero latent period uh, which would allow us to remove the latent period from the model is very unlikely and thus uh, needs to be included. Um, and we do this for all the fixed effects and we ended up keeping uh, dome effects on the latency period, um, E to I, and detectability uh, I to D, and trial effects on um, those same uh, traits as well. Right. Now, this slide here, I know it looks very small, but actually that is an advantage here. You're not supposed to look at the individual um, uh, plots. Instead, get to like an overview of what it looks like. So as Cyrus bespoke software, we need to validate that it's capable of finding the correct outputs. And one way to do this is to use the model to simulate a new set of data 20 different times with known parameters. And then uh, the 95% credible interval that Sire finds should overlap the true mean about 95% of the time. So, um, so we have the uh, true mean in green, and then um, the data is simulated. Sci will come up with a 95% credible interval, interval. And then we uh, we plot these credible intervals for the 20 different simulations, order them by uh, the, the mean, and then we get this sort of tornado um, plot, which we, we can use to visually inspect how well Sire is performing. Uh, if SIA has difficulty locating the true mean, or if there is consistent bias, then this is usually immediately obvious for the, from the tornado plots. For example, if we saw that um, the, the true mean and this weighted mean were far apart, that would be an indication of bias. And if we saw that a lot of the um, credible intervals did not overlap the uh, true mean, then we know that SIA was doing a poor job at estimating that uh, posterior. Um, additionally, for the same set of data, we expect to see good convergence. Uh, if Cyrus having difficulties, they're getting trapped in the local maximum and failing to find the global maximum. Uh, this will often show up as, uh, as poor convergence and runs with different input seeds uh, may end up showing different posteriors. So we'll be using a, a, a Gelman-Rubin convergence diagnostic to confirm that sufficient mixing has occurred. But Chris has done a lot of optimization in SIA to get a good mixing and to avoid getting trapped in local maxima. Um, so now that we trust SIA on the simulated data, uh, we apply it to the fish boost data set. And here we see the posterior distributions for the genetic covariances and the correlations between the traits. So two things to note here. This is the 95% credible interval, um, and I've highlighted the means in the blue bars. Um, the true value could be anywhere within the interval, so the intervals, which are probably, again, too small to see, um, I hope that's legible, and I will certainly make an effort to make it bigger for the WC gulp. Um, so, but the credible intervals here are quite large, which is fair because, I mean, there's all, as the data has a limited power to uh, to provide um, the posteriors, but you know we've done a good job with what we've got. 
Now, we've assumed that the traits are log normally distributed and the variances here are the log values of mean zero. Um, so after this, I've included a multiplier which gives us an idea of uh, the range of phenotypic differences between the individuals at extrema. Um, so, for example, for the uh, so sexual variance, so the uh, chromatode G uh, has value of 2.2. Um, so that would translate into a difference of about 81 times susceptibility between the most susceptible and least susceptible um, individuals. Now, obviously, some uh, you might get lucky uh, and some just don't get the disease. Um, and if that happens several times in the same family, then it's it's hard to get. You can't really put an estimate on it, and that's how you get such a wide um, um, estimate. But with that, with that said, we do see that uh, evidence that there is a genetic variance in all three traits. So, in conclusion, um, the study demonstrates that it is possible to design an experiment to estimate genetic variation in all three epidemiological traits. We've shown evidence and provided empirical estimates of genetic variation in turbot and scuticosiliatosis in all three traits, uh, notably in infectivity. Um, and this supports previous hypotheses that there is substantially more genetic variation underlying disease prevalence than is currently being used in breeding programs. Um, and papers by Bijan Moretel 2021 and uh, Lipschitz Pell et al. 2012 uh, discuss this in more detail. Uh, and these results suggest that it may be possible to select turbots that not only have high genetic resistance and endurance to scuticosiliatosis infection, um, but also less likely to transmit it. And I'd just like to say thank you to the people involved in collecting the data for fish boosts. Um, uh, thank you to Chris Pooley and Glenn Marion um, for their work on SIRE. Uh, and thank you to the funders. Um, this is a recess funded project. And thank you for your time. I need to make it a bit shorter, but. Do you have any in the room and say one line? Good. Yes, you can uh, type on the chat or uh, you can unmute yourself if you would like. Slide 15. Slide 15. Uh, here. Oops. Yeah, I think you can, you can pick up one, one of those blocks and zoom in. Yeah. I, I I could do that. I mean, um, I don't I don't really want to kind of go into the uh, individual um, uh, side. So I kind of I feel that by guessing it by you can have a very good overview of the data submitted by looking at the site at the data and provided in this way but yeah you absolutely can if, if there's one uh, parameter which is causing trouble then if you zoom in you can find out what's going on if there's a lot of bias in that parameter um or to do a bad job of um, of uh, converging on the the posterior i'm just saying for the presentation yeah say you need everything that it is but you bring down uh, one quote on top of those okay. ones, like B with the axis, uh, so that yeah, someone doesn't have to, <laughs> to wonder what the axis name. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to to zoom in to, to um, one of the interesting Just ones, one. such as the like, maybe the covariance, <laughs> <laughs> the best one, yes. Because you went to like to explain, but I still uh, <laughs> yeah, because it's true you have to then totally listen. What yeah, you, uh, because I think I can't <laughs> feel, I can't see, so I think it's really good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And we spent many uh, many hours looking at these uh, plots, and they they have previously been much less good than this. <laughs> it took a while before we managed to uh, improve Sire uh, and um, you know work with the data until we managed to get good convergence. Um, and uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question online, Glenn? Yeah, thanks. 
Um, so thanks, don't Jamie. Don't hear you. You're muted. Are you muted, muted or? Um... Can you hear me now? I don't know. If, I don't know if you're muted or not, but we can. We cannot hear you. So can you type your question, maybe? E yeah, I'll try. I, I don't know why I'm muted. <laughs> Sorry. No, he's not. I can hear him. Okay, so it's here in the room. Can you uh, try again? Hello. Yeah. No. Okay. So it's here in the room, and I don't know how to speaker. Oh, try again. Hi, can you hear me now? <laughs> no. Ah. Yes, the chat is working. So if you have a question, maybe you can pop it in the chat. But yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. We can see you though. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> Let's So, uh, Ricardo has a question, a very popular question for Bayesian analysis is how informative the priors are and how much is your result influenced by? Could you say something about your priors? Um, for the most part, we use fairly uninformative priors, but um, for certain traits such as the uh, latent period, we really had to give it um, a bit of uh, assistance there because there were actually two, there's a latent period and uh, a detection period, and it's very hard for SIA to be able to work out two unknown values because they're both free to uh, to move, and that was one of the ones we had a, a lot of trouble with. In the end, we had to give it a fairly informative prior based on, so we looked at the donors uh, in trial one, and most of them had a, um, latent period of about five days plus or minus two or so so we kind of uh, restricted down to to that uh, and then allowed uh, fixed effects to handle the differences um, so yeah we for the most part we didn't give them terribly uh, informative prize but for the latent periods which was a huge problem for us in this trial uh, we we did try to um, give them more informative prize and they did help a lot with uh, with the fitting. Glenn says he'll email me. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Any other question in, in the room or online for Jamie? Were all of the fish do they all have an asymptomatic period or like can you know that we don't know um you, you kind of so sire is given um the ability to to move these uh, at the time when it becomes infectious but asymptomatic and it will just play around with those times mm -hmm. until it maximizes the uh the, the likelihood um that can be difficult and it can take a long time for it to find those values. Um, we know that that is the case because you know, we, we can tell it has to be the case from some, some of the data, um, but we, we don't, it's very hard to know precisely. You know, we, we, we are inferring something which we cannot observe. Right. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering like, if maybe there's like, like a natural variation in your population, so like some fish have no asymptomatic period and then some fish. And, that's, and then that might be very, uh, yeah. Yeah, said. that's entirely possible. And if you look at the um, the variance that's uh, in the traits, you know, the difference between those with a, with a large um, latent period versus those with a very, very short interval, there is a very big difference there. And some are practically instantaneously, well, not quite instantaneously, but very quickly moving to the um, state where they're infectious. Some are taking very much longer. Uh, in fact, trial two, we had some trial two, the differences were quite different in trial one. Um, so that's why I excluded the, that um, information for these results. Um, but yeah, there were some very long latent periods in trial two. There is a question online from Glenn. Oh, your variance in the genetic parameters don't seem to exclude zero. 
Can you comment? Um, well, uh, you're right. So um, I've done this, is, um, this latest results with uh, fixed effects included, and it's the first time actually that the infectivity seems to have included zero. But still, the the 95% critical interval um, at its limit was still above. I, I, I am aware that it's impossible for it to entirely uh, exclude zero. Um, but yeah, th this. Yeah, but this is on the simulated data, right? That's still on the simulated data. No, the, the, for the posterior. Sorry, for the. Oh. the data. That's. In the true data. In the true data, yes. What uh, Glenn's referring to here is that uh, the posterior for the infra, uh, infection um, trait does touch zero. So, um, yeah. It's However, ninety-five percent. Did it really Well, since it does touch zero, um, that's the the ninety-five percent critical won't actually include zero, um, but. It, it is quite small, so I will agree. Yes, that that does um, weaken the um, I think it's important. I mean, there's been many questions. So this is your only presenting trial on the site. Yes. And the, 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 the problem is that the two trials are still different, but the problem is that you lose so much statistical power from by, by, by cutting the data set in half. And I think you may very get this is something you may need to think about how we answer that or how we address that here because it's absolutely true. You know, it's not you're making big statements that there is genetic variance or so, but there is we're losing a lot of but statistical power by just showing trial one results. Um, so I think we need to think a bit carefully how we how we present that. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? That's why I asked. Any other question? No. So thank we can thank the two uh, speakers of today again. Thank you, Marco and, and Jamie. <laughs> and uh, thank you for attending here and uh, online. And see you next time. And I'll try to. Thank you.